Welcome back to drawing everybody. So for this video, we're going to be talking about color, okay? And so um, for this one, we're going to kind of go over some of our basic, you know, um, definitions as they relate to color. Um, we'll do a little bit of a kind of um, conceptual demonstration here and there. And then um, I'm going to also have another a video for you, uh, a basic intro to the pastels. And then uh, there will be the actual demo video of uh, me doing a uh, drawing with pastels. So uh, you'll be able to see that. All right. So um, just to start off with, we should be pretty familiar with what color is. Um, obviously, it is um you know what's what gives pigment or pigmentation is what gives color to everything but what's interesting is that our perception of color is an interesting phenomenon that um, we physically perceive light that's what our eyes do and um but when we see a color we're actually seeing all but that color so um it's kind of a weird thing to say, but like my black t-shirt here, well, my t-shirt's not a good example, um, but let's say I have a red apple, okay? Well, that red apple is actually absorbing all color wavelengths except for red. So it's actually reflecting red back at us, and that's how we perceive it as being red. So technically speaking, that red apple is every color but red um, on a kind of physics level. But that's that's kind of out of our uh, peer view, if you will. But there are some uh, major kind of definitions that we can talk about in terms of color. And so I've got quite a few to go over here. So we're going to kind of go through this a little quickly. So first and foremost, we have value. And value refers to the relative lightness or darkness of a surface. So for instance, if I have, you know, two uh, squares here and I've got one light and one dark, well, once again, value refers to the kind of relationship between our recognition of these two uh, elements. And so obviously this can be perceived in a myriad of ways. We have a whole, you know, kind of gray range within that as well, all right? So that's something to keep in mind that for our purposes, value is referring to the relative lightness or darkness of a surface. Now, similarly, we also have implied light. And implied light refers to um, the phenomenon in which we perceive value as a relationship rather than an isolated form. So once again, right now we kind of have two values as isolated forms, but implied light begins to kind of also deal with the relationship between our values as well. So you can also think of implied light as being... Um, especially within a work of art, a, an area where we might not have the actual light source referenced in the artwork. So let's say that like in my still lifes and things that uh, I've done for demos, my light source isn't physically in the actual space, unlike say my nocturnal drawing where the light source is one of the main features of that drawing. So once again, uh, implied light can not only be this relationship between, you know, our perception of light and dark, but can also be the implication of light source, of uh, reflected light in a surface. So think about like if I had a, a metal object and there was a blue cup sitting next to it, well, that metal object might be reflecting that blue, you know, light coming off of the cup as well, which would be technically implied light as well. Now, aside from that, we also have what's known as chiro scuro. And chiro scuro is, uh, it's an Italian word. It literally means light and dark. And um, you're probably most familiar with this if you've ever seen Baroque paintings from the 15, 1600s, those like really black 
paintings, but then like the people have these like rather extreme highlights across their their flesh and everything. That is chiaroscuro. So it's a kind of ex violent version of implied light or this relationship between values, okay? So uh, in that sense, chiaroscuro is usually used to um, heighten the dramatic tension within a work of art, especially within Baroque artwork. It was really meant to heighten the kind of dramatic quality of the image and things like that. Now there is an even more extreme version of chiaroscuro that's known as tenebrism, and that was especially popular in places like Spain in the 1600s. So if you ever see, you know, works by guys like Giuseppe de Ribera or um, Zubaran, especially, uh, very, very much this kind of extreme use of chiaroscuro, tenebrism, uh, and things like that. Now, so these all relate to our perception of value of light as a relationship, okay? That is opposed to, say, color itself, which, for our purposes, is the effect on our eyes of light waves of differing wavelengths and frequencies. So, in this sense, um, white light, the light from the sun, is made up of all visible and non-visible wavelengths uh, in uh, the light spectrum. However, certain colors have different wavelengths. So, for instance, uh, red has a very, you know, rapid wavelength. And so it jumps out at us faster and it catches our attention. Um, it's usually used in an emotional way to express anger or hunger or, you know, anything like that that's very energetic, if you will. Whereas, say, blue has a much slower wavelength such as that and so it takes longer for our eyes to physically perceive it, um, and therefore it's more somber, it's more subdued, it's usually used to denote, um, you know, depression or like, um, you know, just a, a more relaxed kind of attitude, things like that, as opposed to the, the jarringness of like reds and oranges and things like that. But psychologically, these colors can be used to influence the viewer well, uh, you know, of a work of art. So, you know, once again, red is and yellow and orange are going to make us more energetic or at least give us a more energetic feeling, whereas blues and greens and things like that are going to give us a more subdued, soft, you know, kind of feeling to them as well, okay? Now, aside from that, we also have what's known as Local color. And local color refers to the color of an object that appears to our eye. Uh, so this would be, you know, things like red, yellow, orange, blue, green, purple, and whatnot. But it's important to note that black is an absorption of all color wavelengths, while white is the reflection of all color wavelengths. So when we see an object that is black such as, you know, the square here, or my t-shirt, or, you know, what have you, versus a, you know, uh, object that is white. So the black object is absorbing all the visible light um, and everything like that, whereas the white is reflecting all of that visible light. So uh, it's, it's a kind of interesting thing. Black and white are not true colors. They're actually achromatic and therefore neutral tones but um that's that's a little bit of a different story but once again local color refers to any color that we can physically perceive and give a name to uh basically versus say black and white now aside from that we also have what's known as achromatic An achromatic refers to a pigment that is without the properties of hue and often referred to as neutral. So technically, achromatic colors would be like white and black, grays, 
Um, usually a lot of earth tones such as browns and like khakis, things like that are referred to as being achromatic. However, that's not exactly the case. Uh, really gray, black, and white are the only true achromatic colors because even browns and like neutral earth tones and things tend to be a little bit one way or the other in terms of warm and cool and, and it, everything like that. So there's a little bit of play there, but achromatic refers to tones that we would normally perceive as being neutral and therefore not, you know, really exaggerated like red, yellow, orange, or more subdued like blue, green, purples, things like that, okay? Now, that is opposed to, say, a hue. And a hue refers to a particular wavelength of spectral color to which we give a name, the colors of the spectrum. So this would be things like red, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, or violet, or what have you, and everything like that. So it's fairly similar to local color in that regard as well. However, local color, we can get much more... Um, extreme with in terms of, you know, like turquoise and magenta and, you know, teal and, you know, what have you versus hue, which is really more referencing those kind of broad spectrum colors. So like yellow, however, we could have canary yellow, cadmium yellow, um, lemon yellow. Those would all be, you know, local colors, whereas the hue itself is yellow. Okay. So it's a subtle distinction there. Now, in regards to that as well, once again, we have value, and so every hue can be influenced by value, and there are several ways that we can influence a hue with value. So one way would be through shade, or a shade, and a shade refers to any color that has had black added to it. So we take a color and we dim it down with, with black, that is shading. So uh, let's say I was to add black into yellow. Well, it's going to create a kind of very dark greenish like color, if you will. But likewise, you know, I could make an even deeper, richer, you know, kind of dark blue by adding black to it and vice versa. Uh, red and black tend to kind of start to become burgundy-esque or almost that like blood red kind of color, things like that. But aside from shade, we also have a tint. And so shade is plus black. But a tint is when we add white to a color. So, you know, anytime we add white to any color, we are tinting it. So um, by taking yellow, like it's, you know, most pure hue value of yellow like think primary yellow or part primary red or blue and we start to add white to it well then we start to get softer transitions so more pastel like colors and things like that and once again all of these things can be you know viewed as a uh, relationship so we can view you know a tint uh, and, a, and a shade of one single color as being a relationship uh, as this kind of transition. And so we'll see that a little bit uh, later on as well. Now, the other thing that we have would be a tone, and that is when we add gray to a color. And so um, this is usually what helps us to make neutral because gray is neutral in and of itself. So when we add it to a pure hue color, then it subdues the intensity of that color and makes it more realistic. So for instance, you know, like my, my hand here, like the inside of my arm, you know, we can see that um, to create some of these kind of subtle pinkish purples, I would actually add a little bit of the blue to the kind of pinkish orange that is the predominant color in my hand and that would tone it down by making those pinkish oranges more neutral. And then I could also tint it with white to create these more subtle kinds of variations in tone or in color, I should say. So uh, once again, all of these things 
are perceived as a relationship against one another. So, you know, um, by adding black, white, or gray to a pure hue, we can influence it greatly. And so that's one way in which we can take a single color and make a huge variety of colors from just basically four different things. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Now, this also gets into what's known as intensity and saturation. And so intensity and saturation refers to the purity of a hue or color. So a pure hue being at its most intense. So think of primary blue, red, and yellow, things like that. Um, you know, from a given color and or at its highest saturation. So, um, you know, in, or at least saturation usually refers to like if we have extreme, like heavy saturation, that means that uh, our, um, our hue is going to be at its most intense. Whereas if we start to lower that saturation by toning, uh, by adding gray or tinting it, things like that, we're going to lower the intensity of that hue or that color. So uh, it can go kind of one way or another. And once again, we'll see some examples of that later too. Now, aside from this, there are a variety of different kinds of ways that we can go about mixing these colors together to create some of these interesting tones. So one way would be through what's known as a subtractive color mixture. And so a subtractive color mixture refers to when pigment mixtures uh, where reflected light is gradually eliminated. So uh, this would be like if we were actually mixing our pastels on the paper or if we were mixing paint together. So if I was to mix red, blue, and uh, yellow primary together, I'm gonna get something that starts to approach this kind of brownish, almost blackish kind of color. But that would be a subtractive color mixture because I'm not adding white to it to tint it. Uh, I am just eliminating the intensity and a range of, of hues by adding them together versus say an additive color mixture. And this is when the light primaries of red, orange, green, and blue, violet combine to create white light. So this is actually how the screen on your cell phone, your TV, your computer, LEDs, all of that works. So, um, you know, we can think of this as being, uh, you know, paint mixing. And we can think of this as like, you know, technology. So once again, these, these are ways that we can go about making mixtures of color, you know, that will, um, you know, create different uh, kind of perceptions in our, or in our perception, I should say. But what we're really going to be dealing with is subtractive color mixing. mixing. And so um, basically, once again, this would be, you know, physically mixing two pigments together versus say, at, or mixing light together and things like that. All right. Now, aside from that, something else we can talk about would be our variety of hues. So we have primary hues. And these are things, and well, specifically, these are red, yellow, and blue. And these are referred to as primary hues because no matter what we do, no matter what colors we mix, we cannot make red, yellow, or blue by mixing two other colors together. Uh, they, it just, it's impossible. So red, yellow, and blue have to already exist, okay? So, but from these three colors, we can make a huge variety of colors. So that brings us to secondary colors or secondary hues.
And secondary hues would be any color made from the intermixing of a primary color. So we would have things like orange, green, and uh, purple or violet, whatever you want to call it. So once again, by mixing a, two primary colors together or two primary hues together, we then get a secondary hue. So red and yellow obviously make orange, yellow and blue make green, red and blue make purple, okay? But we can get even more interesting from there. And so if we go and mix a primary and a secondary color together, we get what's known as a tertiary color. Or tertiary hue and these would be things like red violet blue violet you know green blue yellow green uh, yellow orange orange red you know etc etc so you know um, and well I'm gonna draw a color wheel out here in just a minute so that we can see all these things but um, you know that's uh, an interesting you know kind of fact so uh, let's say let's say that we have yellow and we have red and we have blue so if we were to mix red and yellow together we would get orange if we mixed yellow and blue together we would get green and if we mix red and blue together, we would get purple. Well, let's call it violet. Now, however, if we were to intermix in between these, that's where we get a tertiary color. So we would get something like yellow orange, red orange, Uh, red violet blue violet blue green as well as yellow green okay so once again, by mixing, you know, any primary color, red and yellow, or yellow and blue, blue and red, we get a secondary. So we can say, you know, one, 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 two, 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 and three, 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 and three. Okay, so a uh, pretty basic uh, breakdown there, okay? However, we can also add gray, black, or white to any of these colors, and then once again, we can create a massive variety of colors. And it's also important to note that there's a huge variation in these as well. So, you know, we can have yellow-orange but it could be a much more towards the yellow side or much more towards the orange side and vice versa. We could have a blue violet that's much more of a bluish color uh, or one that's much more on the red side of purple uh, or violet, if you will. So, uh, but even within red violet, we could have one that's much more akin to red or much, one that's much more akin to, you know, straight, you know, violet or purple, if you will. So there's a lot of variation in that. And then once again, by adding gray, black, or white to it, we can also get a huge variation as well. And I'll show you a few examples of that here in a second. Now, it's also important to note that there is a big difference between uh, what's known as cool and warm hues. So it should be pretty self-evident, but roughly speaking, um, we have warm hues and we have cool hues so we have you know warm hues obviously red red orange orange yellow orange yellow yellow green 
versus red, violet, violet, blue, violet, blue, blue, green, and green. So once again, we perceive this half as being warm, vibrant, and everything like that, whereas we perceive this half as being as cool and somber and more subdued, if you will, okay? So I'm gonna erase that for just a sec. I'm also gonna erase our line that divides here. All right, so aside from that, we also have a couple of different color schemes. And so a color scheme refers to a group or a color uh, groups that provide dis or distinct color harmonies. And so um, anytime that we have colors interacting together, we can either consider them to be in a scheme or say a schematic. So uh, things that are jarring, you know, if you will. But let's look at a couple different types of color schemes. Our first and most basic would be monochromatic. Okay, and so monochromatic refers to a color scheme in which we only use one color plus black and white, okay? So, so we take green and then we tint and tone it. So our mid-tone would be the pure kind of green on the color wheel and then we would take it to white and we would take it to black and that would be monochromatic okay but that is opposed to say uh a, you know a complementary color scheme and so a complementary color scheme refers to a color scheme that emphasizes colors that are direct opposites of each other on the wheel. So things like yellow and violet, um, red and green, and orange and blue, okay? But what's interesting is that if we mix two complements together, we actually get a neutral tone. So if we mix red and green together, we would get a kind of uh, brown, reddish brown color, if you will. Likewise, if we mix orange and blue together, we would get a kind of greenish uh, brown as well. And they're all going to make a kind of neutral brown, if you will. But uh, likewise, yellow and violet will make a, a similar kind of tone. But by taking that complementary mixture and then remixing it back into yellow or violet, we can lower the saturation or the intensity of that color and therefore make more variety of, of color. And if we're looking at trying to create realism within our color. That's very important because, you know, my, my skin tone here is not peach color crayon and neither is yours. So we're actually made up of a huge variety of different tones within ourselves. And so just looking at my hand in this light, I can see pinks, I can see oranges, I can see little bits of yellow, uh, little bits of kind of bluish green that come through with like my blood vessels things like that. Uh, there's also a lot of very subtle variations of purple in there and everything like that. But those subtleties, those subtle colors all come from making these kinds of color mixtures where we are mixing uh, complements together to subdue them and create neutrals. And so we'll see some of that in action here in a little bit as, or in our next video as well. Now, it's also interesting in that there is also such a color scheme as a split complement. And that would be when we use one color and then we split it. So like, let's say we were doing yellow, but then we would use red violet and blue violet as instead of just violet itself. Or perhaps we might use, um, you know, uh, orange and blue green and blue violet. So this would be a split complement. And once again, this is another way that in color mixing, we could create even more subtleties or we could create harmonious sets of colors. So uh, in a complementary scheme, we're usually using only yellow and violet to create, or you know, orange and blue, red and green to create a, uh, an image. And that would be with white and black as well. However, with the split complement, we could then do, you know, orange, blue, green, and blue, violet, plus white and black. And now we've got a huge variety of colors that will all kind of be harmonious together, even though we create a wide variety uh, amongst them, if you will. 
Now, aside from that, uh, we also have a color scheme that's known as analogous. And this is a color scheme based on adjacent colors along the color wheel. Uh, so each containing the same hue. So that would be something like, you know, yellow, yellow, green, and yellow, orange, or yellow, green, green, blue, green, or blue, you know, blue, green, blue, blue, violet, things like that. It's usually the three adjacent colors on the color wheel. So, you know, um, but they all have to, once again, so in terms of orange, we could do yellow, orange, orange, red, orange, or red, orange, red, red, violet, or blue, violet, violet, red, violet, things like that. So uh, once again, analogous refers to any, th any three colors with the same base hue uh, that kind of all go together. And once again, this creates a kind of harmonious set of, of uh, holes there. Now, um, I will ask you to excuse me for just a second while I grab uh, something I should have had ready uh, to begin with, but uh, give me just one second. So I actually made these for my painting class. However, hopefully it will be a nice kind of representation of uh, some of these concepts in action before we, I show you with the, uh, the pastels in our next video. So here we can see a, a variety of, um, of tones and hues. So here we have a nice value scale. It's a nine step value scale. We go from white to black. And once again, all of these grays are made through the various combination of white and black together. Now, we also have our color wheels. So we have two different color wheels, uh, both with different, you know, kind of chromas. So, excuse me, and we'll see a, another example of this in a minute. But we can see that, you know, we have uh, a more primary kind of yellow, red and blue, and what we can make from that versus say a more earth tone variety of this. And we'll see another example there here in just a second. All right. But to start off with, we have tint, tone, and shade. So once again, adding white, gray, or black to something. So here we can see a variety of colors uh, that I've mixed up. This is all oil paint, I should say. But um, here we can see, like, let's look right here in the middle. This is a uh, blue-black that I made. So I actually made this black by mixing brown and blue together and uh, I went heavier on the blue side, and then I added yellow to it, so I started tinting it with yellow. But you can also see, here's a blue-black just with, uh, with a tint of white to it. So we can see this one perceives, even though we have a nice kind of neutral gray kind of tone that goes across, we have a black that's more blue in nature versus one that's blue with yellow added into it. But we can see how, you know, adding a neutral gray, you know, such as the one up here to any color will subdue those colors. And we'll see another example of that here in a minute. But this is just kind of an example of uh, the extreme kind of variance in black and gray tones that we can make by simply adding a very, you know, a kind of different color to it. Okay. Now, here we can see another... Um, kind of color, uh, you know, range here. And this is all made out of primary colors. So the only colors I used to make every single color that you see here were nothing more than ultramarine blue, cadmium red, cad yellow, neutral gray, and white. So we can see the more intense hue here. So the actual intense hue is the color that you see all the way on the right here. So we have yellow, green, yellow, yellow, orange, orange, Red, orange, red, red, violet, violet, blue, violet, blue, and blue, green. And then below that, here at the bottom, we can also see what those, you know, kind of colors look like when we mix their primaries together. So um, here we can see yellow plus violet. It makes this kind of, uh, you know, kind of reddish brown. Uh, likewise, we have red plus green. Once again, it, it subdues the red down into a more earthy kind of tone. And, and vice versa. So we have uh, orange plus blue, 
yellow green plus red violet, yellow orange plus blue violet, and blue green plus red orange, um, and everything like that. So those are pure complement mixtures uh, from green down, okay? So we can see how neutral those are. But likewise, we can see what those colors do when we tint them. So we go from the pure hue of red to a much more pinkish tint with or by adding white to it. And vice versa, on the left here, you can see that I've taken the pure hue and I've mixed it with neutral gray, and then I've taken it to white again. So we can see that once again, by adding gray, it neutralizes the intensity of that color and pushes it into a more subdued, somber kind of realm versus say our more purely intense color over here. Now, likewise, uh, there's a lot of variation that can happen in this. So here we can see the exact same palette. However, this time I used earth tones instead of, you know, kind of vibrant, pure hues. So we still have yellow, green, yellow, yellow, orange, orange, uh, red, orange, red, red, violet, uh, violet, blue, violet, blue, uh, green, or blue, green, and green. And then they're complement mixtures together. However, instead of using ultramarine blue, cad red, and cad yellow, which are all very much primary yellow, red, and blue, this time I, er I used earth tones. So I used yellow ochre, which is derived from a type of clay, burnt sienna, which is also a type of clay, as well as phthalo blue, which is a much deeper kind of uh, a stormy blue, if you will. But once again, you can see that I've taken them, the pure hue uh, uh, mixture of these colors and taken them to white. And then I've taken the pure hue again, added neutral gray to it, and then taken it to white again. So we can see perhaps just between these two, the extreme amount of variation that we can make by not only uh, adding um, you know, neutrals such as our grays by adding or mixing complements. Uh, and likewise, we could take like say, um, you know, orange uh, and blue uh, from our neutral or from our earth tone palette. And then we could mix like the middle one of these into uh, say uh, the, the pure kind of mid-tone blue over here and it would subdue that color down kind of in between these two and it would be something probably more akin uh, to something in this range over here as well. But once again, that's, um, that's just, once again, doing this, we can create a huge amount of variety. And I wanted to show you just another one so here we can see, once again, the exact same palette, except this time it was made with synthetic hues. So, um, you know, these are all hues that do not exist in nature. So these are all man-made uh, colors. But for this one, I used, once again, primary red, yellow, and blue, although this time I used lemon yellow, magenta, and cerulean blue. Uh, plus neutral gray and white. And so once again, we can see the corresponding kind of colors, but how they, uh, they kind of dramatically alter. But it's also important to note that a lot of colors that exist in the modern world don't necessarily exist in nature. So for instance, magenta, which we see as red here, is a color that only exists from a laboratory. Uh, you can't go out and find that in nature. But likewise, you can't mix just any old red and white and get that kind of pink or, or that kind of bubblegum or Barbie-like pink because it's made from magenta, okay? So that's something else to keep in mind is that, you know, in uh, when you're dealing with your pastels, you might need to, you know, buy a few like individual sticks here and there if your set doesn't come with a color that you really want to use. And, and, you know, that's fine. Like you can always augment with uh, a few individuals here and there. The only problem is that to buy individual pastels and whatnot, you usually have to go to a specialty place like ASIL Art Supply. Um, you know, Michaels and Hobby Lobby are not going to sell you an individual pastel. But uh, it's something to be aware of if, if that's, you know, something that you want to do, okay? So, um, you know, once again, I, I hope that this is a, a kind of nice uh, introduction to color, if you will. Uh, once again, I'm going to make another video in which I start to do some of these things with the pastel itself so we can actually see some of these mixtures taking place. 
uh, before us and everything like that. But um, until then, that's what I've got for you for this uh, kind of vocab demo video, and we'll see you again next time.